I want to welcome you all to MS Neuro TV. And this event is called Specialty Pharmacy and Multiple Sclerosis and the Insurance Process, Understanding Aspects of Accessing What You Need in Current Times. And wow, current times definitely have changed dramatically and continue to do month to month, week to week, I guess we can say right now. Again, for those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. I too am an MS patient. It's what drives me to do everything that I am doing for the multiple sclerosis community. Um, today, we want to uh, welcome and thank our sponsors. We have Bristol Myers Squibb and we have Biogen. All right. And we're very thankful. A virtual round of applause for them. Everybody clap your hands and we'll just know that you're doing it for them. Okay. All right. So today's program, and we've said this so many times during all of our programs, we ask that everybody keep their questions relative to the topics that are on hand. So again, we're speaking about specialties pharmacy. We're speaking about the insurance process and understanding the aspects in relation to MS. Please do not be asking the doctor anything that relates to anything else, all right? Because he's just not in that qualification to be able to speak about this, all right? He's not gonna speak to you about your cognitive problems or your medications or or even COVID. I mean, there may be a few things that it can answer about COVID, but only if it relates to the topics that are being discussed, okay? So going forward, the doctor, his name is Dr. Gary Owens, all right? And Dr. Gary Owens is a primary care physician by background. He's a former vice chairman of department, former vice chair of Department of Family Medicine at the Medical Center of Delaware. He's a former VP of Medical Management and Policy at the at Independence Blue Cross. He's interested in the management and funding of treatments for multiple sclerosis. And so Dr. Owens is going to speak for 30 minutes, and then we're going to get back and we're going to do Q&A and Again, we took a lot of questions from people who registered online and whoever did not have an opportunity to register online um, during when you were registering for the program or ask your questions at that time. You can ask questions by clicking on the box that's at the top of the page. This should be an orange box with an arrow. All right, click that arrow, type in your questions. We will get to them. Again, though, if they are totally outside the scope of what we're doing, I'm not going to be asking those questions. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and we'll be back. I'll be back in about 30 minutes. Thank you. Dr. Owens, take it away. Well, Stuart, thank you so much for that kind uh, in introduction. And as Stuart said, I'm Gary Owens. And uh, uh, as Stuart also noted, uh, my background is primary care, but I spent uh, a large portion of my uh, uh, career in the insurance world uh, uh, at a Blue Cross plan in the East uh, uh, of the United States. And what we're going to really talk about today, and if we were live, it would certainly be able to be an interactive session, but I recognize that we're uh, able to reach out to all of you through the wonders of technology, but it makes it less possible uh, to be interactive. But I'm going to talk a bit about, you know, one of the questions you have, gee, I have MS, it's a chronic uh, disease, uh, uh, and uh, uh, why would an insurer even care about uh, this category of disease, especially when it's uh, much less frequent than some of the things like diabetes or heart disease or some of the lung diseases? And I'm going to get into that. I'm going to hopefully demystify uh, a little bit about uh, the insurance world by explaining some terms. These may be terms with which you're very familiar. Uh, and if that part uh, is a, a review, uh, that's fine. I do want to talk a good bit about the process of getting your prescriptions, getting your prescriptions filled, what goes on behind the scenes, uh, what you need to know in order to help uh, get the care that you need and deserve. And at the same time, get a little bit of understanding about why insurers actually do what they do uh, in this category. And then as Stuart said, after I've talked to you for about 30 minutes, we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussions. One of the things I always start off with, and I'll be sharing with you some, you know, because you might be asking, gee, why does a primary care doc and also a former insurance uh, executive really uh, present on MS? And we'll get to that in a minute. I will give you the short version. Right now, I do have two family members uh, with the disease, so I've been engaged in the MS community for, for quite a few years. But I think it's always important to know, and I set this up by way of background because it's an important background, and that is many of you may have had the experience 
when your doctor is either starting you on your first prescription or did start you on your first prescription, or maybe is considering changing your medication for one of many, many reasons. Uh, you're not tolerating it well, it's not working well, something new has come out that uh, your physician may feel would be more appropriate for that. Usually you have a discussion about those therapeutic options, uh, that discussion, something called shared decision-making. And that becomes important because you may need to go back from time to time to that shared decision-making stage of the conversation as you work your way through uh, getting your medicine, getting coverage, and working your way through the insurance process. So just that brief word about uh, the, the role of shared decision-making and the importance of having those back and forth discussions with your doctor. In general, treating MS is not one of those <laughs> where the doctor sits you know, <clears throat> in, in that high uh, chair above you, looks down and said, here is absolutely what I want you to do. No questions asked, uh, you're often given. Uh, treatment options and the pros and cons of those treatments. So with that, getting a new prescription filled is easy, right? It, it, it should be, uh, it, you know, if you think about it, when you get a new prescription, if those of you who have high cholesterol or high blood pressure or any other acute medical condition, for the most part, that prescription is either transmitted electronically from your doctor's office or in the old days, they gave you a piece of paper with illegible handwriting and you took it to a pharmacist who actually managed to translate that illegible handwriting into something that uh, uh, turned out to be the medication that your physician prescribed. But the reality in MS, it's a category of uh, uh, drugs that's highly managed by the payers. But whoops, I just put out a term, payer. So what is a payer? So a payer in a very simple definition in the healthcare world, it's an organization. It's an organization that takes care of two things in healthcare. It takes care of the financing of the healthcare and it takes care of the operational aspects. And that is seeing that claims are paid and, and that uh, uh, the workflow gets done to make sure those claims are paid. And, and, and payers actually provide that service in, to healthcare in the United States. And in many ways in the United States, we're very unique uh, in, in that respect. That, that uh, role of a payer in most countries, especially those in the European Union and many other parts of the world, is subsumed by the government. But in the US, we actually have three types of payers. We do have the federal and state governments that administer Medicare and Medicaid programs and combined Medicare and Medicaid. We have employers, and if you are employed, uh, your employer pays a portion, or in some cases, although it's becoming unusually rare now, all of the cost of your health care. And then, of course, we have all of us out there who are private citizens that are paying for a portion and sometimes all of our health care if we're not fortunate enough to have insurance. So what do all these people have in common and payers have in common? They're basically uh, paying for health care out of our pockets, right? Because we're either paying premium or we're paying taxes or we're paying for the care. And, and, and so what are the MS concerns for payers? Well, payers do make a huge lifetime investment in MS treatments. If you think about it, if you're one of those people who are diagnosed at a relatively young age, say in your 20s and 30s, uh, you're likely to be on MS treatment for the rest of your life. And actually my colleagues and I, I did a study and published it in the Journal of Managed Care Pharmacy uh, back in 2013. It's a bit dated now because it's about 10 years old. So these numbers are likely to be larger. But in 2010 dollars, the total lifetime cost on average per patient with MS for all care was just a bit over $4 million. So that's a very large investment. And I think it doesn't take much imagination to understand why payers want to be sure that number one, if you do get a medicine that you take it properly, you stay on that medication, or if you can't stay on it, that you talk to your doctor and switch to an appropriate medication. And number two, they'd like to be sure that you get the right drug the first time out, although that's not always possible in MS or for that matter. Um, and they also focus on ways to get the best outcomes for you in that large lifetime investment. So as we move along, this is where I wanna take a brief pause and, and share with you a, a personal story about MS. And I will share with you, uh, as I did allude to, that there are two members in my family with MS. 
The most recent one to be diagnosed is that uh, uh, individual you see behind me, the uh, camera over on the left-hand side of the screen. That's my second oldest son, who was diagnosed now about four and a half years ago. And one of the things that we share in common is our love for nature, the outdoors, uh, and photography, which is the only reason why we'd probably be crazy enough to venture uh, to the Chilcat uh, Bald Eagle Preserve in the middle of December uh, to do photography. But needless to say, uh, it came as a, certainly a shock to him uh, and, and an unexpected uh, news to me when he received his diagnosis about four and a half years ago. And what it gave me is yet a third perspective. Remember, I practice medicine. So I understood MS from a primary care physician and having some of my patients being cared for by a neurologist and an MS specialist. I understood it as a payer executive, uh, understanding uh, the, the drugs and the cost of therapy and the management. And now suddenly I understood it firsthand uh, from some direct experience that my son had uh, receiving care for MS. So if we can move along. One of the things that he found out very quickly is there's potential for a lot of confusion in the payer world. And as I pointed out in the beginning of the talk, a number of terms that uh, can create those confusion. So let's just jump right into some of those terms. What I'm going to talk to you about are, are these uh, terms that we have here on the screen. And I won't repeat all of them because I'm going to repeat them. I'm going to focus mostly on specialty pharmacy formularies and those steps for you to get a new prescription. So let's first start with looking at benefit plans. A benefit plan really is, in its purest sense of the word, a contract. It's a written contract between the health plan. I've already defined the health plan as a payer and the individual or group, such as your employer or the federal government. And, and a benefit plan, because it is a contract, uh, uh, the payer must adhere to that contract. So they're required to provide all of the benefits in that contract. On the other hand, you as a beneficiary of that contract are required to adhere to the terms and conditions of that. Now that I've said that, I'm willing to wager that virtually all of us, myself included, have not read every word of that benefit plan contract. But if you did, you'd find out some things that might be very important to you. For instance, some services uh, do have limited benefits. Uh, if you need physical therapy, for instance, some benefit plans are able uh, to limit the number of visits to 20, 30, or some other number. Uh, also, uh, as you know, health insurance doesn't pay for anything. So you may have some degree of cost sharing, meaning you're going to pay something beyond what insurance pays. And I'll give you the definitions of some of those things that you pay for in just a moment. But in general, here's the things that that contract, again, the benefit plan must show. So let's take a look at what are those essential benefits that all of us may need from time to time. Not every one of us will need all of these, uh, but the essential benefits, and these were defined in the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, that's been around almost a, a, a decade now. Uh, and uh, in your insurance contract, there will be services provided in laboratory medicine, emergency services, prescription drugs, mental health and substance abuse, uh, maternity care, if that's uh, 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 appropriate to the segment of population, either young enough of the right gender uh, to need them, pediatric uh, services, uh, rehabilitation services, ambulatory patient services, preventive and wellness services, and of course, hospitalization. So in your insurance contract, again, that benefit plan, there will be a description of what is covered in these 10 essential benefits. So uh, I referred to a couple of other terms that I think are very important because that contract does require you as a patient uh, to share a cost with your insurance carrier. Uh, the first important term you need to know is deductible. And that's what you really pay before your insurance benefit starts. And a deductible can be present in a commercial insurance or even in Medicare. You may know that in Medicare, at the beginning of the year, you have to meet a deductible before your Medicare uh, benefit uh, uh, begins to become applicable. What's a copayment? A copayment is the fixed amount you pay towards a service. So uh, if your benefit plan says uh, drugs that are on formulary have a $20 copayment, 
regardless of whether that drug costs $21 or $2,021, your fixed copayment is $20. On the other hand, coinsurance is a variable amount based on a percentage. So if we use that same example, uh, a $21 drug and it were a 10% coinsurance, you'd be paying $2.10. A $2,000 drug, you'd be paying $200. And as I pointed out, with limited areas, because there are some areas, for instance, lifetime maximum, which were taken off the table uh, under the Affordable Care Act, there may be some benefit maximum, such as your insurance plan may fix, uh, contribute a fixed amount of dollars to the amount of medical equipment uh, that you can receive or say the amount of rehabilitative services that you can receive. So those are some just some important terms that you need to understand. Now we're really gonna get into the world of pharmacy because as an MS patient, that's certainly one of the most important things and integral to your care. And here's some terms you really need to know. First is a formulary. And a formulary is really nothing more than a list of medications and sometimes related products like needles and syringes for diabetics or test strips for diabetics, for instance, or uh, sometimes some other uh, uh, disposable medical devices that are supported by current evidence and in the judgment of physicians, pharmacists, and other experts are necessary for the diagnosis and treatment uh, of disease. So it's really a list of medications that your insurance plan has deemed appropriate to cover a wide range of diseases. That doesn't mean the other uh, medications out there aren't covered. What it may mean is that they're covered with lower amounts of uh, payment by the insurance company. So that gets us into, well, how's that determined? Well, first of all, there are three major types of formularies and within those major types are variations that could take me the rest of the day to describe. But first of all, we have open formularies where virtually all drugs are covered, but the uh, formularies will have preferred or generic drug lists where your out-of-pocket cost or your co-payment will be low and then drugs that are not on the formulary, but still accessible where you may have either a higher co-payment or even a 15 or 20 or in some cases, 33% co-insurance. So you could pay a substantial portion. There are open formularies with exclusions. Those open formularies with exclusions have a list of drugs that are not covered and then closed formularies really just it is what they say they are. Here's a list of drugs that you have covered and everything else, you have to get an exception. So you say, why do I really care about that? That sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook and you know, my physician needs to worry about, but why do I need to worry about that? Well, generally because of the formulary, as I've already said, that determines how much you pay out of pocket. As I already said, if it's not there, you may have to pay more out of pocket and if it's on one of those closed formularies or an exclusion list, you may not be able to get it. That is, may not be able to get it easily. Um, and if my drug is not on formulary, is there really an acceptable alternative? Remember my very first slide, shared decision making. You may want to go back to your doctor. And if, if your doctor presented, say, you know, uh, Mr. Owens, I'm going to offer you three alternatives, which I think are all valid uh, for your current condition, you know, let's talk about which one and if the one that you and he select as one of the valid alternatives is not on formulary or heaven forbid is, is going to cost you a large amount out of pocket, maybe the next best step is to go back and talk to your doctor and say, hey, you know, my pharmacist said here's some options that I could have where either my health plan is going to pay almost all of it or the substantial portion, you know, is one of these acceptable or was one of these one of my choices, for instance. So that's why you really need to care about a formulary. Also, there's another term you need to know, and that's step therapy. And it's exactly what it says it is. It's like going up steps, as I've illustrated here. And that is, in some cases, and for some disease states, payers are actually looking to make you what I would say are better uh, comparison shoppers for what you need. And that is, if a generic drug, which is our, typically the, the lowest cost drugs out there, if those are the most appropriate for you, uh, and they also probably carry lower out-of-pocket costs for you, uh, you know, have you try the generic first? If that isn't acceptable, doesn't work, or in the uh, uh, 
determination for your physician isn't appropriate. Is there a preferred drug on the formulary, typically an on-formulary brand, where you may uh, 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 you know, pay uh, less out of pocket? And finally, if there are drugs on the guidelines uh, for your condition that are preferred, uh, they, uh, a payer may require you to use one of those first. But step therapy has some downsides. First of all, it's extremely unpopular. We, we can move right along. Uh, it is extremely unpopular. In a, a recent survey of Michigan healthcare consumers, uh, there was an unfavorable impression of step therapy. And I don't blame people. It, it, it seems like needless work. Uh, gee, my doctor and I decided this is the best drug. I go to the drugstore and my pharmacist tells me, well, your payer thinks there might be a better drug. Uh, yes, it is unpopular. But at the same time, the rationale for a payer doing that is if there is a drug that will be equally as acceptable and is a lower cost and might even cost you less money, why would you not want to do that? So despite its unpopularity, there is a rationale for doing it and it's not just a, an insurance company being uh, stingy. So let's move along to talk about some other things in formulary management. Why should you care about step therapy? Well, uh, you may be required to have tried and failed one of these uh, uh, step drugs. Um, you know, your drug may not be eligible for coverage, but there is an exception process and your physician can ask for that exception. Getting that exception may be easy. For instance, uh, the insurance company may not know that you've already required one of the step drugs because it wasn't in the information available to them. And in that case, it's easy. Your physician just documents yeah, you tried the drug that was required for the step and you didn't tolerate it or it didn't work well, um, let's move on. Or it may not be easy because you may not meet the requirements for an exception. So that's why you really need to care about step therapy, even if you don't like it. And really, I don't blame you for don't, not liking it because it does require some additional work on all of our parts. But let's talk about what else is out there. Uh, there's a term called quantity limits generally. It does apply to MS uh, because your insurance company may say uh, we're going to dispense your medicine in 30-day increments only, uh, so you'll need to have your prescription refilled once a, uh, a month, or they may say that after X number of 30-day refills, you're entitled to get an, a 90-day fill. And again, why do insurance companies do this? Uh, uh, especially, um, you know, why would they do it to an MS patient who's going to be on a drug for a lifetime? Well, let's use the hypothetical scenario that you've just started a new medication. And let's say your first prescription was for 90 days and 10 days into that new medication, your stomach really isn't tolerating that medication. You call your doctor who says, let's try you know, this or that, maybe move the dose to a different time of day or something like that. You try that for another week and really it's no better. And the doctor says, we've got to change your medicine. Well, if you do the math, you're maybe three weeks into a 90-day supply of medications, which will now be sitting in your cabinet and will ultimately need to be disposed of, uh, but which has been paid for. So uh, in many cases, insurance companies will say, until we know that you're stable on a, a dose or a new medication, uh, let's give you a smaller quantity to be sure it, it, it's working. And then there are also some other rationales like uh, uh, an insurance company for those who maybe need an opioid medication. We all know we're in an opioid crisis era. <clears throat> an insurance company may uh, say, uh, we're only going to give you a week or two week supply. So that's why quantity limits are out there. Again, it's not to punish anyone, but it's to make sure that the resource, that scarce resource, which is healthcare dollars are being used appropriately. So what's another term we might want to know about? All of you have experienced this, and that's the dreaded prior authorization, which, as I put in the bottom here, requires the prescriber to receive pre-approval by the payer before prescribing the drug. It's the mother may I approach. Again, it's not terribly popular. It's probably about as unpopular as step therapy. But again, there is a rationale why insurance companies do it, and that is if indeed there are medications that might be equally effective, remember shared decision-making and being able to ask that question. Uh, the goal there is for payers to try to match up the best medication that's safe and effective that also provides the greatest value, which means uh, if you get the same outcome for lower cost, hopefully that means everyone's getting better value. 
So that's what prior authorization is about. Just another couple words if we'll move on there. There are really two kinds of PA. You won't experience in MS likely the soft PA, which is your first doctor prescribes uh, a, a drug, uh, a uh, specialist in the appropriate specialty uh, confirms uh, through an electronic process that that drug is appropriate and the product is approved. You're most likely almost always going to be uh, the beneficiary, if I can use that term loosely, of the hard prior authorization, which means your doctor prescribes the drug, submits uh, the uh, request for approval along with some clinical information. That clinical information is reviewed by the payer against a set of criteria. Um, and uh, the, if the prescription meets those criteria, the prescription is filled. And if it doesn't, uh, uh, there may be a back and forth between uh, your doctor uh, and the uh, the payer to get additional information or to clarify why this is the most appropriate medication. And so that can take some time. So uh, this is where um, I'm, I'm going to uh, beg your indulgence and kind of go back to my personal story. I thought I knew a lot about uh, MS from a clinician standpoint. I thought I knew a lot about MS from a payer standpoint. But when my son got his first prescription, uh, he asked that uh, very cogent question you know, what do I do now? And, and my answer had to be, it depends. Number one, I said, we've got to look at your insurance benefit language, remember that, and, and see what your benefit for this drug is. Number two, we've got to look at your formulary and see if this drug is on formulary. Number three, we've got to look to see if it requires prior authorization. Number four, we look, need to look and see uh, if uh, uh, it requires distribution from a specialty pharmacy. So all these sub bullets that I put here, he couldn't just take it to his corner uh, a drugstore to be filled. Uh, he couldn't, uh, uh, you know, just get the medicine the next day because he needed to work with the specialty pharmacy. And really, he needed to better understand, uh, you know, a, a, a number of behind the scenes interactions that had to happen before he got his prescription. And, and over the four and a half years since his diagnosis, he's actually taught me a few things about this area. So one is never too old to learn. So as we'll see as we move along here, um, I just use some more new terms. Number one, specialty drug. Uh, what is a specialty drug? It's not because the drug itself is special. It's really because the drug is either A, high cost, B, it can be used to treat a complex and generally chronic condition, although we do know now there are some high cost drugs to treat uh, uh, acute conditions, uh, even COVID-19 has some very high cost drugs, such as the monoclonal antibodies to treat that acute condition. Uh, but in general, uh, specialty drugs are those high cost prescription medications uh, that are often uh, developed uh, uh, to treat uh, chronic conditions. So, okay, that's what a specialty drug is. Uh, well, now we need a drugstore to handle those. Uh, and, and what is that? It's a specialty pharmacy. And, and so specialty pharmacies handle those drugs. So what goes on before you get your prescription? Well, remember that hard PA? Well, all that's happening behind the scenes. While your prescription has been transmitted to the specialty pharmacy, the information from your physician is also transmitting information to meet uh, your, your prior authorization. It means the payer is going to need to review that. And in some cases, it may mean there's a back and forth between your physician and the payer. Remember formularies, it also may mean that uh, your drug may or may not be on formulary, and that will ultimately reflect what you may have to pay uh, for your drug. Or it may mean that your physician, again, often behind the scenes, is going to need to justify why your drug is, is the one that you need or should have now, including perhaps even clarifying that you've met the step uh, in the step therapy part of the process. So that's what happens initially, then what goes on next, uh, we'll show as we move along here. Um, if the drug is filled, the prescriptions are approved, that is, uh, it'll get filled by the specialty pharmacy. Uh, while that's happening, the specialty pharmacy is going to reach out and contact you. They need to get some information. They'll clarify they have the right shipping address. They may have the address that your uh, <clears throat> physician provided them, but let's say you're a snowbird and you're in Florida for a couple of months in winter, and that's where you happen to be now, the specialty pharmacy wants to make sure the drug gets shipped to where you are, not where you might have been. 
uh, they'll also contact information. Uh, one of those things that may uh, uh, seem obvious, but they want to make sure uh, that there is a form of payment, uh, not for what the insurance company owes them. That's all handled behind the scenes. But if there uh, is uh, an amount owed by you, the, the patient, they want to make sure that they have a way to receive that payment uh, as well, such as credit cards on file or uh, fund transfers, that sort of thing, or seeking uh, sometimes third party, pardon me, reimbursement uh, uh, through foundations and sometimes uh, uh, drug assistance programs through your pharmaceutical company. Uh, uh, in any case, you will be required or a third party may be required to pay your portion of the drug before it is shipped. Uh, again, remember those uh, uh, difficult terms, deductibles, co-insurance, co-payments, uh, all of which has to be satisfied. Uh, a pharmacist from the specialty pharmacy may contact you to explain your drug, uh, to answer any questions you may have about how it's administered. Uh, if it's a complex administration, uh, they may send uh, uh, a, a nurse or a case manager uh, out to meet with you to explain how to administer your drug. It gets even more uh, uh, complex because your health plan, because remember, that's that uh, entity that uh, may spend uh, upwards of $4 million in a lifetime. They may have a case manager who also wants to talk to you to make sure you know the benefits and risks of your drug and that you're going to stay on it because what is the most expensive drug? It's the one that is paid for, but not taken. Um, uh, you may be contacted by third parties who provide financial assistance. So, you know, no one, no wonder he was confused. And uh, to sometimes uh, that extends, it extended to me because there were some people that contacted him uh, of whom even I wasn't aware. Your physician's office may or may not be aware of all those people who contact you. And I encourage you to, uh, keep your physician aware of all those points of contact, even if they're not germane, just so your physician knows. And, and so we're almost at the end of our journey here today, uh, but there's just a few other things I want to point out. You know, all of this happens behind the scenes, but it can take time. And I'm sure you've all uh, e experienced that. Uh, while there are no specific timelines, there's some rules of thumb. Payers must... Uh, a turnaround, a complete prior authorization request within 72 hours and an urgent one, which is pretty uncommon for long-term medications for MS within 24 hours. On the other hand, if you're suffering from COVID, you want that request to turn around in less than 24 hours if it can be. But remember, I said there may be incomplete requests and that can take a back and forth period of time of up to 30 days. Once the specialty pharmacy gets your prescription, it usually gets filled promptly and usually ship within 24 to 48 hours via overnight shipping. But as we know, uh, as we saw in December of, of this past year, due uh, to a myriad of circumstances, even overnight shippers weren't necessarily able to get things out overnight because of huge backlogs due to the holiday uh, and COVID a collision of almost a perfect storm. And again, remember, they also have to make sure they've got uh, payment from you. And what I put over on the right-hand side of the slide is, is a couple of the biggest challenges uh, with required to prior also really the administrative uh, burden and and, and uh, uh, doing all of the office paperwork as well as the time uh, that it involves. So I know I've uh, talked on almost all of my 30 minutes and we're really coming to the end. What I want to point out, here's all you need to remember in all of that. Getting an MS drug isn't like getting a standard medication for your blood pressure or cholesterol or an acute illness. Because it's a, a, uh, an expensive specialty pharmaceutical, payers care about it. They're going to do some level of management to make sure that they're spending those uh, scarce healthcare resources wisely. The drug will be handled by a specialty pharmacy. It can take more time, sometimes more time than any of us are comfortable with. And even after you get the drug, there may be multiple in, uh, individuals, case managers, financial assistance people, and other people from your health plan that may contact you. But as I put at the bottom in the biggest print in this whole talk, don't worry, you're going to learn to understand the process and how it works. And ultimately, you'll be in control of your own destiny. And what I hope I've done here is really help 
eliminate some of the confusion about those terms, I'm going to leave you with one last thing to remember. So what do I do if things don't go the way uh, I want? What if my PA is rejected? Well, first of all, you should be able to understand why your case is being denied, because by federal regulation, uh, health plans are required to notify you in rating why your uh, case is being denied and what the rationale was. It should also include by federal regulation what you need to do to appeal that. And so that means you need to begin to get working with your doctor and maybe a family member or even with an advocate. What do I need to dispute this? Talk to your doctor. Make sure that all of the information that was necessary was given to the payer. Sometimes your doctors don't know everything. <clears throat> maybe they don't have everything in their history. Then do you, all of you have an insurance card and you can look on the back of that, whether you're on Medicare or commercial insurance, and it will give you at least a website or a phone contact. Go ahead and appeal the decision and in, a, in an appeals process, which could be the subject of another whole uh, half hour of whole half hour. Boy, that's a bit of an oxymoron. Let's say it's a half hour of discussion about what happens in appeals. And ultimately, if you're denied, again, by state regulation in all 50 states of the United States, there are state levels of appeal if all else fails. And in Medicare, believe it or not, you have after your health plan has done two levels of appeal, three more with CMS to make a total of five appeals. So with that, I'm going to stop talking at you and hopefully get a chance to chat with you as I'm very eager and uh, willing to answer questions. So Stuart, the floor is yours, as they say. Firstly, Dr. Owens, we have to thank you very, very much for being here. I'm sure many watching this program, and we do have many, many people online watching. We do have, I am sure they're very happy too. That's what I was trying to say. All right, so we do have a lot of questions, a lot of questions that were asked, as I mentioned earlier, while people were registering for this program. Many others have asked so far um, online as they were listening with you. So if there's anybody else, before I get started, if there's anybody else that have questions, please type them in online and we will hopefully be able to get to them. Again, please keep everything relative to the topic that the topics that were discussed, okay? All right, again, Dr. Owens, thank you. So let's get started, all right? Here we go. MS and senior citizens, wellness, affordable housing, assistive devices, what is not covered by Medicare? Can you answer any of that? I, I, I can. Um, you know, most things are covered by Medicare, but again, it's the famous answer I gave my son. Two words, it depends. Um, it doesn't depend on Medicare because all of us, uh, and I am a Medicare beneficiary, you might be able to uh, determine that from uh, uh, the hair color and perhaps I have a wrinkle or two more than I did when I was uh, uh, 20, not many more, Stuart, just one, one or two. Um, uh, you know, Medicare parts, uh, 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 part A is that part uh, that covers hospitalization. And when you turn 65, you have Medicare uh, part A. Medicare part A also covers home care services and, uh, and, and things like that. So we all have that. But I think the thing you need to remember is, you know, Medicare is basically an 80-20 plan, which means Traditional Medicare pays for 80% of stuff, except hospitalizations. And I won't get into all the complexities of the out-of-pocket cost of hospitalizations and the limit on the number of days, but let's just say it pays for hospitalizations and home care. Part B is optional, but most of us, the vast majority of, of seniors in the United States have opted to take Part B. And uh, you'll notice that because if you're uh, receiving Social Security benefits, your Part B premiums are deducted before you receive your payment uh, every month. So that Part B premium is that portion you pay for your health uh, insurance. Uh, Part B, again, is an 80-20 plan, and Part B pays for drugs given in a doctor's office or in a hospital. It pays for physician office services. It pays for things like physical therapy and other outpatient services whoa, doc, you just didn't say anything about my drugs. Well, that's because you have to have a Medicare drug plan. Uh, that wasn't uh, didn't come along until 2006, uh, some 40 years after 1966, which is when Medicare Parts A and B 
were launched. And you also have to have a Medicare drug benefit program to get those drugs not given in a doctor's office or a hospital paid for. And there again, that's where all those terms I threw in because Medicare uh, drug programs or what are affectionately known uh, as Part D. And again, wait a minute, Doc, you skipped C, but I'll explain that in a minute as well. Medicare Part D covers your drugs. And that's where all those things like formularies and specialty pharmacy and coinsurances and deductibles and all that other stuff uh, I, I have uh, talked about comes into play. And, and the last but by no means least is Medicare Part C. Medicare Part C is the combination of Parts B and D. So I guess they averaged those two and got a C out of it. And those are the Medicare managed care plan. So if you're in a managed care plan, say a, a, a managed care plan by your local Blue Cross affiliate, so you're in a Medicare HMO or PPO plan, or you're one by large national carriers like Humana, Cigna, Aetna, on and on and on. Uh, then your benefit plan is even different uh, because uh, they uh, use monies given to them by the government to cover not only your drugs, but all other services. And you may have very different out-of-pocket costs. So, you know, that's the what Medicare coverage for MSN seniors at a very, very high level, Stuart, probably after that, we'd have to delve into almost an afternoon's worth of uh, charts and graphs, maybe the subject of another uh, coverage talk. We are definitely going to get you involved with that because, well, I just became a Medicare uh, patient as well. And this just started on February 1st for me. And wow, the, um, the, the stress that I had to go through with finding the correct plan using almost the entire month of January to do so and learning the differences between the A and the B and the uh, and the Medicare and the, uh, excuse me, the Medigap and or the supplements, the PPO Advantage and so on. And there are a lot of people that have been asking me questions about this. I said that I'll make a video about it, but I really think that I just need to have an MSX, I mean, a Medicare, Medicaid expert to be online with us to do this. So maybe you'll uh, consider doing that with us in the future. Okay? I can consider that. And I have a couple of colleagues, too, I might recommend. It might even make a good roundtable, Stuart, if you ever do those. Sure, that would be great. I would love to be part of that. And then I could bring in everything that I learned as a patient and the stress involved with doing all this, okay? But right. I did send there around- There are nuances in Medicare and Medicaid both that are often very subtle. Right, so for those that don't know though, that the, uh, the PPO Advantage plan, uh, I know that I got it through uh, Blue Cross, but I don't know about the other plans, but that includes your, uh, your pharmaceuticals as well, your, yeah, your medications. Part B and D. Right, right. It's just combined. You don't even know it as D, though. It's just it's nope. there. All right. So going forward, um, somebody else is asking to please discuss insurance for seniors. Um, like, where is there a cutoff or where does where can it begin other than using Medicare? Really, in the United States, you, you really don't have a great choice other than Medicare. I mean, you would you would be probably not well advised uh, uh, to do something outside of Medicare. First of all, uh, you know, Medicare Part A begins when you're 65. Uh, Medicare Part B, you're given the option, uh, as I pointed out, to take. So uh, most of us who become Medicare beneficiaries at a minimum take Medicare Parts A and B. That's what's called traditional uh, Medicare. After that, as Stuart said, he spent the entire month researching what are my options in, in supplemental coverages. And supplemental coverages are those insurance plans. You've heard about them, AARP, a big provider of those, uh, lots of private insurance carriers, especially the local blues plans. And then, as Stuart also pointed out, there are what's called the Medicare Managed plan, Care Plans, which now cover more than a third of all Medicare beneficiaries, which roll all that stuff into one plan and you really just have one seamless uh, plan. But uh, I guess my best advice there is don't look outside of Medicare except to see what the valid options are for you to get additional coverage above and beyond uh, Medicare. Now, I recognize when you do that sometimes, the affordability of that additional coverage may be an important point for many of us, uh, um, and you have to weigh those. Um, so, uh, again, it's a, it, it is a complicated uh, decision and it becomes more complicated 
uh, depending on the state. For instance, if you're in New York, Florida, California, your choices may be dozens and dozens of choices. If you happen to be in my little uh, home state of Delaware, uh, your choices are much more limited because far fewer carriers write coverage uh, uh, there. In some ways, they make it easy for you because you have fewer choices. On the other hand, you have uh, probably uh, less ability to uh, uh, financially manipulate the system. All right. So I'm going to ask another step for, about this. So many people, obviously, with disability or on disability, starting at possibly a very early age, have to go on to Medicare simply because they are permanently disabled, whether it be for multiple sclerosis or anything else. So what happens, though, if a person who was listed as quite disabled then finds that maybe they were in their early 30s and now they're in their mid 40s or upper 40s or early 50s and all of a sudden they're feeling well and they decide that they want to go back to work and they decide what they want to get into insurance a real insurance program how does that work for them i mean how is the transition from medicare back to the real world of insurance work out gee story you asked a great question with which i've never uh, been faced, and that is, how do I voluntarily terminate my Medicare coverage? I'm, I'm sure, and uh, I, I could probably reach across my my desk and open my drawer. We all have that Medicare booklet, right? That uh, uh, has uh, a couple of hundred pages in it, and somewhere buried in that, or on the website, is a process for terminating uh, Medicare. I honestly, Stuart, don't know what it is, but let's presume you do that and you go back into the working world, then you would be just like anybody else with insurance coverage uh, from your employer. That is, you would be required to take whatever your employer offers, uh, which is usually a limited number of plans. Most employers uh, offer a PPO plan, an HMO plan, and, and maybe a, a choice of uh, 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 you know some other hybrid things like a, an integrated delivery network, again, the subject of something that would be too broad for this, but uh, assuming that you voluntarily terminate uh, your Medicare benefits uh, again until you become 65, then you would be just like anybody else who's employed as far as obtaining new insurance. Or if your employer doesn't offer it, but you go to work, then you'd be able to get insurance through the, the um, healthcare exchanges. Okay, great. Well, I've always been known for asking a complex question. So good thing I got to you early on this and not later, because you might have been too tired to figure that one out. Okay. So next person is asking if you can please explain the Medicare Part C. This is by Pamela. Yeah, Pamela, Medicare Part C is uh, what I I touched on it in my uh, question with Stuart. Uh, uh, Medicare Part C is that uh, a portion of Medicare that actually Stuart decided to take for himself, uh, which is that Medicare managed care plan, which means on your behalf, the government pays the insurance company a fixed monthly fee, your behalf and tens or hundreds of thousands of other people. And that insurance carrier provides for you the Medicare Part A services, hospitalization and home care, the Part B services, outpatient services and uh, uh, drugs administered by your doctor and Medicare Part D, uh, which are the drug plans. So basically Medicare Part C uh, is that uh, portion of Medicare that rolls that all into one. Very often you don't have to pay a premium or it's a very inconsequential premium. You've probably seen those ads on TV. You know, John did this in Medicare, but Mary did that and she got $144 and some change more in her monthly social security check. That's because they stopped taking out your Part B premiums and that money went directly uh, from the government to your health plan to, to take care of your needs. Uh, so those are those Medicare managed care plans. Uh, you often get more benefits in those plans. Sometimes your choice is limited uh, as to the number of providers you can use and the number of hospitals and even sometimes the formularies. But they're very high value plans for, uh, especially if your budget is limited uh, or you're not necessarily interested in, in paying out any more money for something uh, that uh, a Medicare Part C plan adequately meets your needs. Again, it does take some research. Um, this is where you may want to get a family member uh, involved. Uh, there are also insurance brokers that uh, work with seniors. Uh, 
I will caution you to take them with a degree of caution because uh, uh, there are also salespeople who often uh, want to direct you and sell you the plan that not only benefits you, but may benefit them in terms of uh, fees for placing you in that. So uh, you do your own homework as well if you're able to do it or you know get some help there. Thank you. Can specialty pharmacy ever deny a person, even if they're on Medicare, for a formulary medication? If the drug is on formulary, it still can, because remember, there is the issue of uh, uh, prior authorization. So let's say you don't meet the criteria for prior authorization, or that formulary drug requires a step through a drug that's preferred that you weren't prescribed. In both of those cases, yes, you will receive a denial letter saying, for instance, uh, uh, dear Mrs. Jones, uh, we have received your request for product X. However, product X, uh, you did not meet the requirements for that because of, uh, and then they'll fill in the blanks there, um, preferred products that you might be able uh, to use as an alternative that could be provided to you uh, and covered uh, un under the terms of your plan would be the following, please discuss this with your physician. So yes, that can happen even in Medicare. Uh, now, remember that happens only in uh, Medicare Part D plans or Medicare Part C plans. Medicare Part D or B is in boy traditional Medicare without a drug plan wrapped into it or without a managed care plan wrapped into it does not require prior authorization because the federal government administers that. Okay, thank you for that. Now, Beth has an interesting question. How does insurance work with your deduct when your deductible is met by patient assistance? Another answer that it depends. Um, basically, uh, if you were to have asked this question about five years ago, I would say that once patient assistance has contributed uh, the amount equal to your deductible or to your co-insurance, after that insurance pays the rest. That's pretty simple, right? Uh, the claims payment systems were uh, literally not, uh, did not care who satisfied the member out of pocket cost as long as it was satisfied. And the specialty pharmacies that distributed these medicines diff did not care either. Fast forward to 2021, and a number of insurer, uh, insurers and the employers they serve, and this was often at the request of the employers or uh, the benefit consultants the employers use, now use what are called copayment accumulators. And that is, they actually record the source of who paid the copayment. So uh, if the copayment was paid by a third party, not the member, while that counts towards your deductible, or accounts towards satisfying you getting the prescription, once your um, charitable contribution is maximized, then your deductible and coinsurance kicks in. So those copayment accumulators allow you to maximize your uh, third party payment assistance, but once that runs out, meaning you hit the maximum that, that comes from the manufacturer or a 501c3 foundation, one of the foundations that's out there, then you are going to be required to satisfy your portion of the payment responsibility. So it got a little more complicated in the last five years. Okay, next, are there any drugs that have better coverage insurance wise than another or easier insurance coverage? Let's stick with those that are for multiple sclerosis. Yeah, say, let's Otherwise, MS. yeah we could be here forever. and. And, 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 and yes, I think uh, they're certainly the older, what we used to call the ABCR drugs, the interferon uh, copaxone or glutaramir drugs, uh, generally enjoy almost uh, universal formulary status. Uh, and if you happen to be one of those patients who's on one of those drugs uh, and has been doing well on them for uh, you know a long time or get newly prescribed one of those drugs, uh, uh, you know, those virtually are covered under every insurance plan. Most insurance plans after that will have one or two preferred self-injectable agents and they can vary by insurance company. They will have one or two preferred oral uh, agents and then we'll often have one or two preferred in infusional uh, agents. Uh, uh, 
so typically the old ABCR drugs, uh, uh, not very highly managed by payers, even though uh, they're, they're somewhat expensive. Uh, the newer drugs, it's going to vary a good bit from payer to payer. So it's really hard, except to say the general category is all payers, uh, e even the most restrictive ones will give you a choice of preferred, therefore easier to get and lower out of pocket uh, cost drugs. Hence the reason I you know, spent a lot of time beating on the doors of that shared decision-making, meaning, you know, can I ask my doctor, should I ask my doctor, if one of the drugs it's much easier for me to get would be as appropriate as the one we started with. If not, then you fight the fight. If it is, why do that? Why not uh, get a drug that your doctor thinks is equally as efficacious as it isn't going to cost you uh, nearly as much money? Okay, thank you. So a person wants to know if um, if they have to travel quite a distance to have a an infusion in this case, um, and it's far from where they live, and if they have to stay in a hotel because of the process to start that infusion medication, will an insurance company pick up on the stay for the hotel? Well, here's where the bad news is. No, uh, unfortunately, travel services almost in all insurance carriers are, are not covered uh, by uh, uh, in insurance, and that includes meals, mileage, uh, uh, hotel, uh, and and the like. There are a few rare exceptions, and those rare exceptions are things like if you are one of those people who may need a transplant, and your insurance company uh, uh, contracts with the Transplant Center of Excellence, for instance, they may want all bone marrow transplants to be done at Sloan Kettering uh, in New York or Dana Farber. Uh, in Boston, then they will cover your travel expenses because uh, they have uh, chosen that as a center of excellence. There's even more bad news on this front, and that is some third-party assistance foundations that provide uh, uh, assistance um, for travel will cover mileage in hotels, but they generally don't cover things like meals, uh, uh, dry cleaning, laundry services, uh, uh, they have rules that are often very similar to employer-based uh, uh, expense account reimbursements. So uh, don't expect a lot of those to be covered uh, regardless of the circumstance. Might the pharmaceutical company itself pay for that process? They can. They can unless you're under Medicare. And then they can't, uh, they can't pay for any of those services directly if you're a Medicare beneficiary. That's why we have those copayment assistance foundations like uh, Patient Assistance Network Foundation, HealthWell, National uh, uh, Association of Rare Diseases, and on and on and on. Okay. When might a, thank you for those answers. Uh, when might a newer DMT be covered? Uh, such as any of the new medications that are out there? Will their insurance be able to pick up on this right away? Or is it something that they have to get into and see what might be covered um, concerning a new, newer medication? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Again, it's going to vary uh, by payer. There are a number of payers. Uh, I'll give you an example of a very large national payer, United. Uh, basically reviews all new drugs within 90 days, but those drugs are considered covered by exception only, which means your doctor has to justify a reason for an exception until they're reviewed. You're required uh, uh, in, in plans like that to only get it by exception. Other plans with open formularies, the day the drug is launched, will put the drug on the highest applicable tier, which means it'll be put in the highest copayment or coinsurance tier, and then there are yet other plans that will decide on a drug within 30 to 60 days. Uh, in general, you can expect the drug to be uh, either not covered or covered at the highest tier until uh, they uh, decide. But newer doesn't mean uh, not covered eventually. I mean, a lot of new drugs come out that create an incredibly good benefit for MS patients and payers, you know, recognize that those data uh, are, are compared to some of the older drugs are superior, and they'll often uh, put those drugs on formulary fairly quickly because they'd, they'd rather pay for a drug that's much more effective and much likely to be tolerated in a patient than pay for a drug that's also expensive uh, that may not be effective or not be tolerated and therefore be wasted. Okay. So for, for medication, though, that is not covered, 
Somebody wrote that there's a wonderful bridge to a commercial insurance plan. Do you know anything about this? A wonderful bridge to a commercial insurance plan. I'm not that's, sure I've heard that's that. All that was written. I, I, a bridge. I don't know. I don't. I, I really don't know what this is about. So if the person is online right, right now, some of the hubs will, you know, search out uh, assistance that's available. Uh, those are attached to specialty pharmacies or set up by manufacturers, and they might help search uh, where you as an individual couldn't for assistance or uh, sometimes even uh, there there are services out there that can, you know, hunt for insurance carriers that might have more broad coverage. But remember, that may not be applicable in your state. Not all carriers write in, in every region and every state. So but in, in terms of a bridge terminology, that's one that is new to me as well, Stuart. OK. All right. So if the person that wrote that question in online, um, if they can, please um, explain a little bit further about that question. Maybe we could ask it a little a little bit differently. Thank you. All right. So Cynthia would like to know, is home health care covered by Medicare if you don't have help at home? Well, again, it's an it depends. So home health care is covered if your services uh, are those that require the use of a professional to provide those services. So if your home health care requires administration of a medication or doing a therapy type service or doing something that requires a licensed professional to do that service in the home, then yes, that is covered by Medicare. On the other hand, if the home health care service is such as an aide who is helping you with activities of daily living or bathing or house cleaning or cooking or meal preparation, then no, those are not covered by Medicare. Okay, so another thing being asked. Thank you for that answer, and um, I'm I'm forgetting to say thank you in between. But oh, just take it, take it that getting to talk that everything's a thank you. All right, Stuart is thanks enough. Yeah, so I'm just trying to read through all these questions and make sure I can ask them before just asking them. So um, somebody's writing here that under key symptom patient assistance program in the process of figuring out the right form right now. And that's the person, though, that was asking about this bridge, evidently, to to um, commercial insurance. So I, I still don't know the actual question. So, uh, Beth, if you could ask again, that would be great. OK. All yeah. right. Now, another one. Nick is asking um, um, if there's any way or any other thing to cover out of pocket costs after an insurance pays for whatever medication it might be, they're still gonna be out of pocket costs. Is there another place for them to go to to help cover these? Yeah, after insurance is finished, uh, you know, again, I'll refer you back to, uh, first of all, many, if you're not Medicare, many manufacturers have assistance programs. Uh, so you, you, you know, want to see if the manufacturer of your product has a, a, a copayment assistance program uh, or something equivalent to that many times specialty pharmacies have financial uh, uh, branches that will help you locate uh, <clears throat> assistance. So don't be afraid to ask the question when the specialty pharmacy contacts you, are there any assistances? There are, if you're under Medicare, the private foundations, uh, which are funded by uh, grants. Those grants can't be uh, directed towards any one patient uh, uh, they have to be directed towards disease states. Uh, they also can't be directed towards any one drug. And there are those foundations. And again, there are a number of those uh, out out there uh, that uh, very often the, the uh, specialty pharmacies can help you locate. And then many times your doctor's offices uh, also have financial counselors to help you find those. So yeah, there, there are a number of programs out there. The one caveat, Remember, I did tell you about those what are called copayment accumulators, and those copayment accumulators may not eliminate your need to pay. They may just defer it until that assistance runs out, and then you're still going to be faced with the, the need to pay. So uh, nothing is foolproof in, in, in this. Okay, great. So Paula has come up with a good question, and that I'm hoping that you could talk a little bit about good RX and how that works and why specialty meds may not qualify for these discounted programs. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, the um, 
the, the good RX programs, uh, and, and they're excellent programs. Uh, if you don't have any insurance or, you know, find you're in need of a, a prescription that isn't covered by your insurance and uh, you, you've lost your appeals, um, you know, the, these programs are discount programs. And so what they, uh, they're, they're indirectly funded by the manufacturers of, of, of drugs as well as uh, big uh, 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 chain pharmaceutical uh, uh, dispensing organizations. Uh, and, and so what they do is they allow you to take advantage of discount programs that uh, uh, big purchasers like insurance carriers and Medicare uh, get for things. So, so in essence, they're passing along discount. It, it, it's almost like a coupon programs at the at the grocery store, right? Uh, who will be, ultimately pays for the gap when you use a dollar coupon to get a, a bag of frozen peas? It's the guy who made the bag of frozen peas, and so that's what happens in these these uh, discount programs that are out there. Okay. Next question: How can the financial aid be easier to help us to request and pre-qualify for help? Generally, these financial aid programs do have uh, uh, in income requirements. Uh, for instance, the copayment assistance uh, foundations will usually set their th threshold uh, at some multiple of the FPL, which is the federal poverty level. Now, it's not at the fed. Pardon me, at the federal poverty level, it's often three, four, five, or more times the federal poverty level. Likewise, manufacturers assistance programs may have. Uh, a, a test of income, they may not. Um, although sometimes it probably doesn't seem fair. Somebody's making three hundred thousand dollars a year uh, to give them the same amount of financial assistance uh, of somebody who's living on Social Security, for instance. Uh, uh, and again, it's often the financial offices at your doctor's office, the RX hub, or the specialty pharmacy that can help direct you in the appropriate direction to find out which one best uh, meets uh, your needs, but do be expected to provide some financial information uh, uh, because most of these have limited resources and they want to make sure that those resources are going to those who most need it. Okay, thank you. All right, so a few people wrote in that they have been dropped by various pharmaceutical assistance uh, plans or you know where they were getting assisted funding. Um, for paying for their medications. And they want to know how else they can be, you know, what what are the funding assistance programs might be available elsewhere? Yeah. So usually when you're dropped by the pharmaceutical program, it's because A, you're no longer on their medication, which uh, makes sense. B, uh, you have maximized the amount that they're able to, to give each recipient. Or C, you've aged into Medicare, at which point they can no longer offer you that uh, uh, that benefit, or D, uh, you've gotten into Medicare or Medicare Medicaid because you are disabled. Uh, so typically, uh, at that point, you're then going to have to turn, especially if you're in Medicare, to the, the the assistance foundations. But the assistance foundations, again, don't limit themselves just to Medicare beneficiaries. You can, as a non-Medicare beneficiary, if you have no other source of assistance and meet the income requirements, apply there. The good news is. They do have money. The bad news is they have limited money and that money runs out very often. So you'll apply to one of those assistance foundations and you'll get uh, told, thank you very much, Stuart. We've taken your applications. You meet the qualifications. You meet the qualifications for a grant of $7,000 this year, but there are 362 people on the waiting list ahead of you. Uh, and and uh, it, you know when your name comes up, we'll notify you and start applying that assistance. So uh, the good news is there is money out there through foundations. Uh, uh, the bad news is it's not unlimited. Okay. All right. Specific to specialty pharmacy for MS medications, how can they monitor or assess for drug interactions? Medications are dispensed by more than pharmacy, more than one specialty pharmacy. So is there a way that they um, cooperate with each other to come up with any interactions? In general, they don't necessarily, let me start over again because there's really two answers to this. If the two medications that you get are covered by two different insurance plans, there won't be uh, uh, an interaction there. And each specialty pharmacy is going to depend on you as the patient when you do your profile 
or when you talk to the pharmacist to let them know what medications you're on. And yes, at that point, all of those specialty pharmacies have uh, uh, not only trained pharmacists, but uh, some pretty sophisticated uh, software to, to look for drug-drug interactions, not only between two specialty drugs, but between your specialty drugs and maybe the drug you're taking for high blood pressure, diabetes, or heart disease. If the same insurance company covers <coughs> both products through different specialty pharmacies, which can happen because there are drugs that have a limited number of specialty pharmacies that distribute them, and that may not be the preferred specialty pharmacy, that information will transfer automatically because the common point of contact is the claim system at the insurance company. So if the two specialty pharmacies are covered by the same carrier, that can happen behind the scenes. If not, it's going to depend on you as the patient to keep your profile updated, which is something that's in your best interest. I know it seems like TD, uh, tedium to do that. Uh, you know, I never like it when I go to my my dentist and every six months when I'm there, he asks me to update my drug profile, but I recognize the rationale uh, for that because the last thing I want is uh, for my dentist to administer something in the office that's going to directly conflict with a drug I took an hour before I went there. Okay, so Diane just wrote that um, for people wanting help in finding uh, who might be covering certain medications, that they can contact the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. Thank you for that information, Diane. I'm sure that'll help people. By it the is. way, for everybody that's online, um, please know that we are recording this. So you might be writing notes or whatever it is, but we will have this on our YouTube channel in the uh, coming days, okay? So it'll be less than a week and you'll be able to see it online. You'll be able to review everything that we have discussed here today, okay? All right, so next, um, running out of some questions. So this is good because we'll wind up in the right amount of timing here. Can, um, let's see, can an insurance company make you change your MS drug from say a person using a pill to an infusion or from, or from an infusion to a pill or otherwise? I, th I think the most important word there, and it's a very key word, can my insurance company make me switch? And the answer is no. An insurance company can never make you switch. But having said that, recognize that they can say that the drug that you requested doesn't meet our criteria for coverage. And the financial burden of having to pay for that yourself, should you and your physician choose to do it, may effectively uh, create the reason for a switch. And again, that's the reason I always tell people, go back and talk to your doctor and say, here's some alternatives the insurance company has offered. Are these appropriate? If they are, why, why not switch? Because it will save you money, it will save the insurance company money. And you say, why do I care about the insurance company? Because eventually, uh, if you were all the way back in the beginning of my talk, in the end, we all pay for health care for everybody else through taxes and payroll deductions and other things like that. And if, if in the end, you and your doctor say, this is the medicine I need, Remember that very last slide, well, it was actually the penultimate slide because the last slide was the question slide. Be willing to fight the battle of appeal. Appeals are often successful, but they do take work and they're a pain in the butt. Uh, but insurance companies will uh, overturn appeals when, when they're rational. All right, so going back to that thing that we brought up earlier about a bridge, um, evidently there's some kind of bridge insurance that you can get that will pay for things as you, um, as you, your insurance may stop covering you for a drug and, and before they start up again. I really don't know how this works, but I'm hoping we can find information on it going forward. Yeah, I'd like to learn more about that as, as, as well. Not something we sold at the Blues or any other carrier that I've been involved with. So I, I'd be interested in that. Sure, great. All right, and then, um, so when you were saying though about uh, going back now to what the question you were just talking about, the insurance, on uh, not working for you or not covering or turning down something. What about the insurance companies though that are telling people that they don't wanna cover you anymore because of age? So you've reached 65 and they don't wanna cover you. You don't wanna go on Medicare yet, or maybe you decided that you're not gonna retire at 65. Maybe you wanna hold out to you 67 or beyond, but um, using regular insurance, commercial insurance, and they don't wanna pay for your coverage anymore. What happens? Um, yeah, yeah, well, that uh, unfortunately isn't an employer's prerogative. They can 
at age 65 uh, say, look, you have Medicare available to you. Uh, and my rules are uh, that once you become Medicare eligible, all of us do become Medicare eligible at 65. You don't become Social Security eligible at 65 for for your full benefit. That's uh, uh, age related and depending on when you were born. But they yeah, they can say, you know, once you reach 65, my own employer, Blue Cross Plan, uh, requires everybody who reaches age 65 to take Medicare and then you know, I, I then get supplemental coverage through them. It's a way your employer is saving money because they know that you've paid your Medicare taxes throughout your life uh, and Medicare is eligible to you. There's there's really not much you can do there except go out and buy your own insurance coverage on the exchange. And I'm sure. not sure why you'd want to do that because I don't think that the, the bang for the buck you're going to get, uh, you'd have to run the numbers. But I would suspect unless you bought a um, a platinum level plan through uh, individual coverage, you're going to be better off with Medicare and supplemental and spend less money. Okay. So just getting into a few more questions that remain and staying on the same line where you were just at, a person wrote, I'm interested about insurance when I can no longer work. Is it possible still to obtain? Yeah, uh, Not on Medicare. Yeah, no longer able to work. Your, your options include many. Um, you know, first option, if you're no longer able to work and you are declared disabled because you're no longer able to work, you can become Medicare eligible um, at, after a period of time. Uh, the second option is you could go out and buy a plan on the exchange uh, marketplace. Uh, the third option is uh, uh, there, there are uh, uh, cooperative plans written out there uh, these are insurance co-ops uh, uh, that you can also buy. I always caution people, make sure you know what you're buying before you buy it and, 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 and what's covered. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, if, if your income stops totally and your asset threshold falls below the, the Medicaid threshold in your state, you can become eligible for Medicaid coverage. So your options, if you're no longer employed, disability, insurance uh, through the exchanges, insurance through co-ops, uh, Medi Medicaid, uh, and, and sometimes you may even be duly eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, uh, but there are time run-ins uh, for those programs. Okay, thank you for that. All right, now, getting into something a little bit different, I have a couple of COVID questions to ask, only sure. as it relates, only as it relates. Now, when people go for their vaccines, they're asked ahead of time or even when they are first there, if they have commercial insurance or Medicare, is it necessary for them to have to provide this? And what happens if they don't? Will they still get vaccinated? That's likely going to depend on, on what state you're in. Most, most, uh, most well, no, I would say Medicare and virtually all commercial insurance carriers offer first dollar coverage on COVID vaccine. So if you have the insurance, it's gonna be first dollar coverage because it falls under that category of benefits way, way back in the beginning of my talk called Preventive Health Services, which have, uh, again, through the Affordable Act, Care Act, 100% coverage. Many states have received grant money uh, to cover those who are under or uninsured. While, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have to provide your insurance if it's first dollar coverage, you know, why not? Because then that allows the state grant money to go to those who truly don't have any other coverage. Uh, ultimately, the goal in the United States too is, is to make sure that anyone who wants a COVID vaccine can get it without cost, but there are as many variations on that as there are the 50 states and maybe even the counties within the 50 states. Okay, thank you. Here's an interesting question. Will medical insurance or Medicare pick up on things such as medical marijuana? Well, not yet, uh, but there are some cannabinoid drug products that have specific indications in types of epilepsy uh, that are already covered. Uh, most insurance plans, uh, uh, again, remember it's a contract and in the contract exclusions that's listed as an exclusion. Um, I think it's probably gonna take a while, if ever, before insurance companies cover uh, uh, medical marijuana, it's not necessarily as well regulated as pharmaceuticals at the corner drugstore or through the specialty 
pharmacy and I, I think insurance companies are very hesitant to, uh, uh, you know, uh, for instance, Medicare does not cover the treatment of things like obesity and erectile dysfunction just because they couldn't figure out how to, to regulate its use. That's where insurance companies are on medical marijuana, including medic. Well, med in the federal law, uh, marijuana is still a, a Schedule One drug, so Medicare can't cover it by federal law. That's true. Okay, thank you for that. Last question, all right? Last question. For those that are seeking insurance, or those that are seeking Medicare, where can they, before they decide on a plan, how do they go about to find if their medication is on that plan's formulary listings? Yeah, it's generally easy. And Medicare, it is easy. You go to the CMS website, uh, cms.gov, and uh, you, you, know, you will need to learn to navigate that website. But when you go to the Part D section, um, you can... Uh, do searches by plan uh, for covered drugs. Likewise, if you're contemplating, say, uh, a major health plan, a Kaiser, a Net, uh, Blue Cross, they all have websites that allow you to do drug uh, lookups. Um, I have not used, but I know there are also uh, some uh, uh, drug lookup applications that will allow you to search multiple health plans at the same time uh, for is my drug covered and how is it covered? under the different plans. So it's it's mostly out there and available on the web. Now, you know, what if I don't have a computer? What if I'm not web literate? Uh, it, you know, then it gets a good bit more difficult. That's where brokers sometimes can help you uh, make choices of health plans. But remember, a broker's in the business to sell you insurance as well uh, as to uh, make profits for themselves. And that's not demeaning them. That's their business model. Uh, they will sell you good coverage, uh, uh, but uh, don't always necessarily present you with every option that you may have. Great, thank you for that. And I lied, I have one more question, all right? No problem. I didn't, I didn't mean to lie, but you know, it was just a small fib, okay. So people wanna know, more than one, asking if home infusions will be covered under any of the insurance plans. All, home, all. Me yeah. Medicare covers home infusion under part A uh, and Private insurers cover home infusions under their medical benefit. For the most part, um, insurance plans welcome home infusions. And the reason they welcome home infusions, it's typically a much lower cost site of care, uh, uh, meaning you're not paying for a treatment room or an infusion chair or uh, an outpatient hospital chair. Um, you are paying for the infusion and the infusion nurse to go to your home. Uh, but it never hurts to ask your insurance plan, you know, can my drug be given an infusion uh, at home? Now, there are some drugs that specifically it's not safe to give them at home. So you also need to talk to your doctor to make sure that he or she is comfortable that the drug you're getting can be infused at, at, at home. Uh, remember, some of the monoclonal antibodies for MS do have injection site reactions uh, and some of those in rare individuals uh, can be significant. So uh, they, you know, your doctor may not want to do the first infusion or two until they see how you do. But yeah, the, by all means, ask about home infusion because insurance companies welcome that, uh, as does Medicare. So they will cover both the medication and the process then? And the process. Okay, great. All right. I don't see any other questions and I'm out of questions. So I think we had uh, quite a great afternoon here. We had many questions asked, and um, I want to thank you, doctor, again. I want to thank our um, our supporters of today's program. As people could see on the screen behind me, we have Bristol Myers Squibb, we have Biogen. I want to thank everybody for being part of this MSU's and News program. We cannot attend or create these programs without having you, our viewers, be here. And so I do thank you all for being with us. Have a great day, everybody. Dr. Owens, I'll speak to you later on. Be well. Stuart, as always, it's a pleasure to see you and uh, to, to all the group out there. It's a pleasure to chat with all of you and wishing you uh, good health as we navigate these difficult waters. Great. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.